Thank you. Thank you very much. Check, check, check. Thank you very much. I made her spellbound. Thank you very much, everyone. It's so great to be here. Um, uh, uh, like Kate so graciously said, my name is Dan Cavanaugh, and I am a musician, and a professor, and a dad, and a human being, and uh, a Midwesterner. Um, and it's really great to be here. I, I also want to thank Winchester Academy and Trinity for, for helping support this. Um, uh, when I first got contacted about this, we were talking about doing a talk, and then I had this harebrained idea like, well, what if we do it with a piano and all these things? And it kind of turned into a thing. So thank you to everyone for kind of uh, uh, going along with that whim. Um, I actually like to start out talks like this um, without saying anything first, because I think it, it actually serves, or I hope it serves to prove a point about what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, that was an improvisation I just did. I just made that up. Um, it's kind of a jazz thing, uh, but it's, it's a whole different thing. I learned to do this uh, young, but to, to stand up, uh, I guess sit down, <laughs> in front of a bunch of people and uh, kind of open your soul and make something up from scratch um, and to try and capture some sort of energy in the room or something is, is something I've really grown to enjoy and think is really important um, for us all as human beings. And so um, I will do that a couple more times tonight, th kind of throughout the talk, just to, to kind of mark some moments. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy those too. Um, this, excuse me, 
Um, this talk is called Music and the Human Spirit. Um, I'm going to just tell you just a, a bit about me. And I made this PowerPoint for a smaller room. I kind of had professor classroom in my head. And so if, if these are really hard to read, I, I am happy to provide the Academy, the PowerPoint you put on the website or something. So if you can't read this, I'm going to say all the things that are on there anyway, so don't worry too much. Um, but also very happy to make this available afterwards. Um, but like I said, I'm a composer and a piano player. I grew up in St. Paul um, and uh, went to St. Olaf College for my undergrad and uh, was not a singer of all the things at St. Olaf Music Program. I was not a singer. Um, and, uh, you know, that instilled in me a love of, of music, but also of learning that um, I think I try to continue to capture in my life and go after. Um, I'm going to play for you um, now a recording of another piece of music that shows the other side of me. I'm also a classical composer, so I have, I have done both things in my life where I have um, written classical music and done all of that, and I also have a master's degree in jazz composition and all of that, and uh, uh, was a jazz professor in Texas. So um, I really think these two things are kind of just, you know, two sides of the same coin. So this next is just maybe a minute excerpt from a piece that just was premiered in June. This is called Building God, and I'll tell you about the title in a second. And then it goes on from there. Um, so that was a piece I wrote called Building God, and it, 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 um, it's a 14-minute piece, so we're not going to get the whole gist. That's from the uh, kind of the middle end section. Um, but it really, it, it was a response to artificial intelligence, and really um, the reason I wanted to play it tonight, because the, the piece is really about, uh, in that piece I really explored, like, what can AI do, and what can AI not do, and what will it not ever be able to do? Um, and so this, this whole piece was about, I asked uh, uh, an AI, uh, Microsoft AI, to generate a melody for me, and it was, of course, really stupid <laughs> uh, and not very musical. And, but, but some of those notes in this piece came from that, and, and the whole point was transforming this kind of machine-generated thing into something that hopefully captures some beauty. So um, I have... Like I said, I've spent my whole life thinking about this. I started piano lessons when I was four. Um, so those of you who did that when you were younger, that's probably about half the population in, in, in the Western cultures anyway, um, I did that thing and thought I was gonna be a chemist when I went to college, and, but also was doing music. And I called my parents um, at the end of my sophomore year and I said, you know, I'm gonna, uh, at, by that point I was a double major in math and music and, I said, you know, I'm going to drop math and I'm just going to do music. And my dad apparently hung up after the call and turned to my mom and said, well, he's going to live with us forever. <laughs> <laughs> and every time I see him, uh, he brings that story up. It's really wonderful. Um, so, 
So anyway, but, but I, really, I really have come to believe this in my life. You know, when you're young, you, you engage in, in music or, or the arts because they're, they're important to you as a person and because they're fun to do and they're exciting. And the more I've done this in my life, the more I have come to really believe that it is of extreme importance for, for us to have folks who do this for their living, right? Not just as a hobby or not just something. That's not going to be every one of us. I always say that it, you know, you'll see this later on, but you need, you need people to listen and make music. Otherwise, it, you know, it's like the tree in the woods kind of thing. Um, but anyway, I wanted to, one of the things I'm going to talk about a lot today, and it, it will lead to a point, this is, um, I'm a big fan of poetry, and partially that is because my uncle is a poet. Uh, his name is Timothy Young. Um, and at an early age, I kind of was able to, uh, you know, learn kind of the artistic way of looking at things from him. Um, but he also would have poets over. And if there's anyone crazier than jazz musicians on this planet, it's poets. <laughs> so, um, you know, I got exposed to a way of thinking about the world that, that was different than what I was getting in school. Um, in my dissertation, I talked a lot about... Um, why the arts are important, and especially music. And this quote was in there, and I thought it was really important to share with you. Um, so William Carlos Williams is, is a wonderful poet, and this is from um, the poem Asphodel, the Greeny Flower. That greeny flower? That greeny flower. Um, and this is a really long poem, you know, seven or eight or nine or 20 pages or something, but this stanza really stuck out to me. So, it is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably, every day for lack of what is found there, right? And so what is he saying there? Um, talking about you don't get news from poems, you, you don't get scientific facts, you don't get things that, well, you do get things that might help you with your life um, and your work. Um, but, you know, in general, we have come as a society, and this was written 50 years ago, I think, um, maybe a little longer. Um, we, we're talking about how this stuff isn't important. And yet what we're missing if we ignore this side of life is we miss a piece of what makes us human. That's, that's what this stanza is talking about. And this has stuck with me ever since I read it. And I like sharing it with people because of that. I'm going to now dive into, I'm going to weave my way through a couple of different subjects before we actually start talking about music. Because of all the things um, that I think are important, the ones that are really interesting to me are the ones that draw from all of these different areas of study and places where humans have learned and, and discovered things. Um, so I want to talk about this phrase, and I told you about Timothy Young, my uncle. He and I just had this great email conversation just last week because I was corresponding with him about this talk, um, about the word epistemology. And um, epistemology is one of those big scary words, and um, people in my profession in academia have in the past used big scary words to make thinking about things inaccessible to people who didn't know those big scary words, right? <laughs> so I'm not going to say that word too much after this, but I do want to say that um, epistemology simply means the study of knowledge or the philosophy of knowledge. And that's a very broad way to put it. I'm sure if there were actual PhDs in philosophy in here, they would disagree with me about that definition. But I think for our purposes, that's a great, um, great way to think about it. And I want to talk to you a little bit about how I've come to agree with many of humanity's really great thinkers, whether they have been academics, um, you know, philosophers, or spiritual thinkers, um, folks from all different cultures, whether it's the Western cultures we might be most familiar with, or Eastern philosophy, those kinds of things. Thinking about the different kinds of knowledge that we hold um, as human beings, because knowledge is a human construct, right? So first I'm going to start with um, yet another, another person philosophers can throw around and scare you with. This is Immanuel Kant, who was one of Europe's most famous philosophers. Um, he wrote a, a treatise, uh, multiple actually, but the one I want to talk about is this, this one he called The Critique of Judgment. And in that very dense, and it, you know, if you know German language, um, which I don't. I know enough to know that it's a super dense language, and you know, the words are this long because they take all the words and scrunch them together to make one big word. Um, but anyway, then translate that into English, and that's what Kant is, uh, reading Kant is like. But he talks about this concept, and he's really trying to figure this out, 
um, this, this idea about <laughs> beauty and the sublime. And how are those two things different, right? Sometimes we think they're maybe in the same category, um, but I've always been fascinated with the idea that beauty, that, I mean, it is a cliche, but it's a really deep thought, beauty being in the eye of the beholder, right? So what you might say is beautiful um, doesn't necessarily translate into what I might think is beautiful or what triggers ideas of beauty in, in my thought process. Feeling, a lot of times beauty is a feeling, right? And then there's the sublime, which is something besides beauty. Um, and I, I'm going to point, I think it's really important, by the way, you're going to see on each of these slides, I have pictures of these people. And um, you'll see why, because I don't want it to be all men, all right? Um, and I think it's important. We haven't done a good job of that in our culture. Um, but anyway, Kant was a man, and he talked about beauty and the sublime. Um, and he talked about the difference in how the sublime was something past beauty, right? Something we're not quite able to understand. You get awe. So the sense of awe, right, is, is a feeling of the sublime, right? That, you know, when you get, you know, when you get goosebumps on the back of your neck, you're listening to your favorite piece of music or you're having some sort of really intense experience that's called frisian, by the way, psychologists call that frisian. Um, but that, that is, is a sublime type of experience, right? When you access these things that you're not actually quite ready to talk about. Um, and, and the great European romantic thinkers talked about the sublime a lot and poets are exceptionally good at, at pulling from the sublime, at opening up access to the sublime. It's really a, um, a wonderful thing. So anyway, he talked about this. He also related the concept of the sublime to the profound, which is a very similar type of a concept, right? What does it mean for something to be profound, right? This, this idea of depth, right? Something is, we say, so, oh, that's a really deep thought. Um, that type of language in describing things has roots in, in German romanticism. Um, they, they would kind of talk about this all the time. And it really ties into this idea of profound. And we actually see those two words together a lot, profound depth, right? But when we're talking about Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, kind of one of the most famous Western European pieces of music, um, there is a profound depth to that work. And it, it gets me even more profound if you're a highly trained musician, right? I had a wonderful professor in my freshman year of college, and he said, you know, I, I know some of you are coming to music and you're afraid that if you learn more about music, it's actually gonna make it less exciting for you. And it's actually the opposite, right? Especially with these profound pieces that we engage with. And this happens in all the arts. This happens in painting, this happens in dance, this happens in film, this happens in literature, on and on and on, right? There was a great, almost um, mystical kind of writer and thinker um, in the 20th century, and this, that was Aldous Huxley. He, if you might not know him from this quote, but he wrote A Brave New World, that famous book. Um, and so um, Aldous Huxley, in, in a group of essays, he wrote a lot about this kind of gray area between philosophical dry philosophical academic way of thinking of things in, in a very spiritual um, approach to understanding, feeling. Um, you know, so in the, a lot of times we, we would describe that as mystical, but he has this wonderful quote from an essay um, that goes, after silence, there should be a comma there, but he didn't have one in his book, so I didn't put it there. After silence, that which comes nearest to expressing the inexpressible is music. And that is, I just, I actually just found this quote. So by the way, this, this is in preparation, these talks I'm giving for me to write a book with this topic. So if you have feedback for me, you send me an email and be like, that was horrible. Go right ahead. Um, I'd love to hear it. Uh, anyway, I just found this quote a couple of months ago. I hadn't known it before. Um, and it really drove home for me um, why I have inexplicab in inexplicably felt my whole life, how that music was so important for not just me, but for the world, right? I think this is one of the reasons. It's not the only thing that can express, come closest to expressing the, the inexpressible, but, but it is one of the main things. It's pretty, pretty incredible. I'm gonna keep on that thread. 
So we're talking about this idea, and there is a point to this. I will bring this into music, so bear with me. I am a professor. I have to do these things. Uh, <laughs> you're probably laughing because you had an actual experience like that when you were in college. Um, <laughs> haven't we all? Um, but I want to talk about this philosopher. She's British. Um, her name is Fiona Hughes, and she, did, she wrote a big book on Kant and his aesthetic epistemology, right? So his, his way of thinking about the knowledge of aesthetics, right? Um, and, and there's a way that modern scientists tend to think about epistemology now that, that's, here's the definition. Remember before I said it was a pretty broad definition? What, what they might say now is that epistemology is the philosophical study of cognitive success, right? So, yeah, yeah, we're going down a rabbit hole here. Um, but essentially, what this means is that, that, you know, thinking about how we produce knowledge and store knowledge, um, our brains, the way they work, and neuroscience has done a really wonderful job of sh kind of validating all of this stuff, um, has really shown us that we kind of make these, these guesses, and then those guesses are either validated or not. And all this happens really, really fast and in real time, and I'm really, really oversimplifying neuroscience, right? That's kind of uh, a lot of psychology and neuroscience into, into one little bullet point. But that's essentially what's happening. So I think for our purposes, and what drives me is that there are, there are this cognitive success model but there's also other kinds of knowledge, right? And lots of people have written about this, like I said at the beginning. Um, and the thing that's important to me is knowledge that occurs without the use of words, right? So going back to my uncle, the poet, um, we've had lots of amazing conversations where we talk about, you know, where, where do these feelings come from? At what level does that knowledge exist, or does that feeling exist? And sometimes the, the line between those two are blurry knowledge and feeling, right? Well, poets tend to use metaphor and imagery through the use of words to kind of unfold knowledge for us, or unfold access to knowledge. But if we do something like I did at the beginning, music without words, right? We can't really count opera, for example, or pop music that has words in this, or Broadway. Um, but if we're just talking about sound, that's a different way to access what we call aesthetic knowledge, right? So these are really aesthetic experiences, experiences of the beauty of sublime, of sublimity, um, of the profound, right? In some ways, it's very parallel to spirituality. And, and you'll find people writing about that's, that these things are kind of one and the same, right? Or two sides of the same coin. If we go all the way back to one of the very famous early philosophers, Plato, right? You probably thought you'd never have to hear about Plato again. Um, but Plato actually argued that this idea of knowing, so cognition, right? Knowing something, understanding something, requires an element of abstractness in order for it to be fully successful, right? Or in order to have some sort of value beyond like these really basic facts. Right? And I think music is a perfect example to illustrate that. That's what we miss in our computers right now, in AI. Right? There's a whole bunch of abstract on the input side, because right now our, our computer scientists can't look inside and see how AI does what it does, which is kind of scary. Um, but when it comes out, there's, there's nothing abstract there. Right? So I have another quote for you. This is, once again, from Fiona. Um, Hodges, and then I'm going to, um, I'm sorry, Fiona Hughes, and then I'm going to play a little bit more. She's talking about um, Kant's idea about the beauty, about beauty and the sublime and the profound. And she says, the harmony of the faculties, so our senses, um, arise across differences. Thus, the possibility of disruption and disruption for her is kind of how we, we gain something new, right? It's always implicit. It's always, it's there already. The beautiful, so now this is the really important part. The beautiful marks a moment when our senses make sense of something in the world. So that's beautiful. We can, we can comprehend the beautiful. We can understand using all of our faculties, all of our senses, touch, taste, vision, hearing, um, 
we can get to beauty through that. And that beauty might be different for you than me, right? But, but when we're talking about the sublime, that's when our senses don't quite work. These, I feel bad for these people because you're right, it's like in a college class, it's like they're in the front row and so like I hone in on you all the time. <laughs> Appreciate you, yeah. Um, anyway, when we get to the sublime, that's when our senses fail us. That's where the mystery piece comes in, right? So all of these concepts play into, and I will make a point, draw this back to music, all right? So, so keep these things in your head as I'm playing. This idea between, uh, uh, this contrast between beauty and the sublime, right? And the sublime can be beautiful. I think it is less common for something that's beautiful in a traditional sense to have a sense of the sublime in it. But when it does, boy, when those two things come together, it's amazing, right? And then think of the profound, right? And how those three concepts, which are very closely re related, interplay, okay? And, and I'll get to the point here about what it means about humans in a second. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna play another improvised meditation that's not jazz this time.
All right. Thank you. So it's interesting when you don't. Let me turn this off again. Nope. So it's interesting when you don't know where those are going to go. So, um, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I was, throughout that, I was what I was doing in my head. So I have been playing the piano for over 40 years now, essentially, right? Um, and so the technique part has manifested itself. I've spent many hours in the practice room um, and on stage and all of these things, and I've screwed up a lot and, and on stage screwed up. Uh, you know, these things lead to a, to, to a sense of being able to let go. Um, you, you talk about athletes, or you, you talk to athletes, especially at the highest of levels, the Olympics right now. If you talk to an Olympic athlete, um, there's this concept called flow that athletes will talk about. This is the same thing that happens in the arts, especially arts that are temporal, right? So in time, music. Um, dance is the same way, right? I think there can be a flow in theater, for example. Um, but anyway, I wanted to interject that, that moment of accessing a different type of space, a different kind of knowledge, before we go back to talking about these philosophers who talk about knowledge. The next person I want to talk about, another British philosopher, um, Lewis Arnaud Reed. And he, um, he, he really talked a lot about the philosophy of art education, actually, and why it's important to have education. He's talking about art, like little a art. So, um, you know, so painting and drawing and sculpture, those kinds of arts. Um, but he has this really wonderful way to access, um, to give us a way to think about how our brains can, can access these other kinds of knowledge that we often do intrinsically without knowing it, without words, right? Um, and he, he, he writes this analogy of a ladder, right? And so it's kind of like words, and this is the way that linguists think our brains work, right? Or at least they're fairly certain. Um, words are, are, are not meaning, right? Um, words kind of live a layer above the meaning, which is why you can, you know, talk to someone from another culture with a different language with your hands and still understand. Um, right? So, so that's a good indication that there's something besides words that, that us as humans understand. Um, and, and Reed talked about this analogy where it's like you're climbing a ladder, right? And you need words to get to this point, right? This kind of mythical, whether this is the sublime or this is some highfalutin concept uh, or whatever. Um, you climb this ladder with words and with metaphors and analogy, but by the time you get up here and you get to the knowledge, and you figure it out in your gut, right? You can kick that ladder away and you don't need the words and the metaphors anymore. You only need those when you try to bring that knowledge back into kind of our everyday lives where we're trying to talk about it. And that's why metaphors are so important, which is his argument that he makes. I think it's a really wonderful way to think about all these different ways of understanding something. He talks about, um, you know, there's, I'm not going to get too technical, but, um, you know, it's like knowing someone, right? So I don't know you, I've never met you before, um, but I know a little bit, Wendy, because we did tech, tech check here and we had dinner, and I know Kate because we had dinner, right? And that's different than how well I know my own children. That is a way to know something, right? Likewise, I know that, um, uh, that Madison is the capital of Wisconsin, and that's a different kind of knowing. That's a factual type of knowing that, that is that way because, you know, we can make a rational argument and show the laws that were passed when back in the 1800s when it made Madison the capital of Wisconsin. That's a different type of knowing. So there's all these types of knowing, but what we're most interested in is how we use our everyday way of going about things to get to this level of knowing that we don't need words for anymore, all right? And Reed provided us with a, a way to think that through. Now I want to move away from philosophers, which can get kind of dry, um, into poets, which is the opposite of dry, right? Um, poets uh, use metaphor and imagery in a way that 
that I can't do in music. Music is incapable of carrying actual linguistic meaning unless there's words with the music, right? Um, so I want to tell you about this guy. Um, if you haven't heard of him, Robert Bly, he's a, an American poet. He li actually lived in Minnesota. Um, and he wrote an essay in 1967 called Leaping Poetry, and it kind of expanded into a book in the early 70s. Um, very in influential in, in uh, ways that poet, poets think about things. And he used the analogy in one of his essays about this, this poetic leap where you, um, in, in ancient Chinese cultures, they would talk about dragon smoke. So, so when you would, you know, the, the Chinese dragon concept, um, and you know, wherever the dragon went, smoke would follow, right? The dragon smoke. Um, and what Robert Bly talked about what, was that this was a metaphor, a cultural metaphor um, for kind of a psychological leap into the unknown parts of our mind, right? And so as, as, as with many cultures, um, the way we talk about and analyze things in Western society nowadays has really, is really only now starting to catch up with what a lot of ancient cultures figured out over millennia, right? And I think this is one of them. It's really cool. Um, but Robert Bly talked about this a lot. I was fortunate one summer to spend a week with him in an artist retreat. And it was one of the coolest weeks I've ever had. Um, my uncle was one of his mentees, which is, which is how I, I met Robert. Um, but really an influential thinker and an amazing poet. Um, so I want to take something from a non-Western culture for a second here too that actually explores the exact same concept. Um, Robert Blywood, in one of his books of poetry, he actually wrote something um, saying that um, you know, a lot of the poetry happens in between the stanzas. Right? This, is, this is kind of akin to what Reed said about climbing that ladder and then kicking the words away. Right? So the poetry, the actual knowledge that we get, the aesthetic knowledge in our guts and in our hearts, happens in between the stanzas. Right? The words are just a way to get there. The words themselves are not the actual poetry. And boy, he got some flack for that. Um, but I think uh, a lot of people now, after that set for 50 years, that, that way of thinking, um, they're starting to dig into that. I want to talk about this guy, Tyson Yunka Porta, who is an indigenous scholar. He's at, um, at a university in Australia, and he runs a center for, what is it, indigenous knowledge systems um, in Melbourne. Um, and he wrote a really cool book called Sand Talk. Um, and if, if you have a chance to read that, it's, it's really a great read. Um, talks about, in, you know, Aboriginal Australian um, cultural knowledge and, and ways of thinking. Um, but he has a, a, a quote here that is the same exact thing that Robert Bly is talking about. Um, that people today will mostly focus on points of connection, the nodes of interest, like stars in the sky. But the real understanding, the real knowledge, comes in the spaces in between the points of connection. Very similar to Robert Bly's concept about the poetry happens between the stanzas. What does all this have to do with music? And I'm finally getting to the, to the meat here. Music is one of those art forms that it, if you don't have words, that is all about the in-between. That's all about the sublime. It's all about the profound, or at least it tries to be, right? It doesn't have these constructs of language to get there, right? And so, um, these various disciplines looking at what's happening here, all, you know, whether it's you know, ancient Chinese cultural knowledge, right, about the dragon smoke, whether it's poetic knowledge about the spaces in between the stanzas, aboriginal cultural knowledge about understanding, that happens between the points of connection, right? That's what really gives us that gut level knowledge that we don't always get from words. And if we do get them from words, it's because we use those words as a ladder to get up here and then kick that ladder away. So I have proposed a concept called the aesthetic leap. And this is kind of takes Robert Bly's concept of the poetic leap, leaping from the part of the known part of your uh, consciousness to the subconscious to the unknown and back. Um, that can happen in any art form, right? That can happen in music. That can happen in dance. 
That can happen in sculpture. Um, and I think the point here that I want you to, one of the points I want you to take home with you as you're going about your daily lives is that aesthetic knowledge, it's a different kind of knowledge than we think about every day, right? But we feel it all the time. Again, you know, I've said it's, it's not unlike spiritual knowledge, right? Or if you have a very powerful religious experience. If you have a near-death experience, right? Neuroscience can't figure that one out, um, no matter what they do. So in music, I think this idea about achieving this aesthetic leap into new, new kind of non, I don't want to say non-truth knowledge, that's not the right phrase, um, but non-conceptual uh, non knowledge, right? Aesthetic knowledge. Um, it has to do with time in music, and so that's how music is different than other art forms, right? So in order for us, if you're reading a novel, a wonderful novel, you, ha you can put it down and come back to it. You have that opportunity. If you're sitting in here and I'm playing, the only way for you to disrupt that is to leave, right? Um, and so there, there's an immediacy to music that forces us to have that kind of consideration, even if we don't know we're doing it, it's subconscious a lot, forces us to have this consideration of what are these, what, what is happening here, right? What's going on? We might not be having these kinds of thoughts with words in our head. We might not be saying what is happening here, what's going on. We are processing that aesthetically, right? We're processing that through our gut, through our feelings, right? Through our heart. And that's really important. And what's really cool about this is that science is starting to catch up to explaining how some of this happens, all right? So what makes us human beings? What does all this stuff have to do with the human spirit, right? The whole talk is music and the human spirit, and I've talked very little about music today, um, right? I'm really concerned about AI, artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm, I think it's really cool at the same time and amazing. It's an amazing testament to human ingenuity. Um, but I've thought about this a lot to the point that, to the point where I've asked the university for us to hire a music and AI person, a faculty member next year, because I think it's that important to society and how we're thinking about things in the world. Um, but how in this age of you can type a prompt into a computer and write a fairly bad poem for you, but it's still kind of amazing, how do we think about being human? I think that's through the arts, that's through literature, that's our human connection. We had a great conversation at dinner before this about the importance of being around a table and talking to each other instead of talking through your phones, right? We've all had these conversations. Um, and I think so many of us human beings feel that, right? And I think the arts are one really important way to go after that. And I think music is a unique one because, because of the way it's structured, because of time. Um, and because all of the cultural associations with music. How do we participate in being human, right? I, I have long been fascinated with the why. Science can tell us the what, right? So when we're talking about neuroaesthetics and, you know, scientists studying, um, so neuroaesthetics is the neurological study of what happens during a scientific, I'm sorry, the neurological study of what happens during an aesthetic experience. So if you're sitting here and listening to me play and you hooked up a bunch of electrodes to your brain and did an fMRI on it, um, and then you know, trained scientists could study that, um, they could pinpoint what they found, for example, is that when we're having these experiences, our brain circuits are activated, are, the, are some of the same ones that were activated, for example, um, in like ancestral humans when elephants were charging after them or when they were alert for predators or when they were scanning their horizon. Um, it's the same, like our brain has repurposed those networks because most of us don't really have to worry too much about a tiger lunging after us every day. There are some people in this world who do have to worry about that. I would guess the people in this room don't. Um, right? But our brain is so amazing, it's so plastic that it can repurpose these circuits, right? So it's a very deeply um, centered way of experiencing the world. And as we have uh, grown as human beings and flourished as, as a species into this age where we can do things like 
program AI and find a way for a computer to create an agenda item for us for our next meeting in less than five seconds. Um, you know, we have done these things collectively as human beings. Um, our brain hasn't needed those circuits for the same things anymore. And so over time, and this has happened in many cultures, music and the arts are important in many cultures, right? Not just Western European based cultures. Um, our, our, our brains have evolved or repurposed those circuits and aesthetics has filled filled those spaces for us, right? It's a way for us to get after some of these primitive um, understandings, I think is the way to put it, right? I want to talk to you about one other person today. Her name is G. Gabrielle Starr. Um, and she's an amazing uh, scholar. She's the president of Pomona College in California. Um, and she was trained, sorry, she was trained as a, um, uh, like a, a scholar of 18th century British literature, of all things. Um, and then she got some fancy, fancy grant to go do like neuroscience training for a couple of years, like expert level neuroscience training. And so the combination she has um, is very rare in this world to have, have that level of understanding of the humanity's way of approaching something and this very um, intense neuroscience training has led to some really fascinating writing that she's done. And she has a book called Feeling Beauty that I highly recommend you read. It's really fantastic. And it talks about these very things I'm talking about with the brain circuits and all of these things. There's a whole kind of burgeoning field of neuroaesthetics um, that she's a big part of. Um, and she is, She's incredible. I mean, I couldn't think of a better person to run a liberal arts college. I mean, she's just really inspiring. This is, this is her, her big, she just had a book come out like six months ago, and this is one of the big conclusions of the book. So she says, what I advanced then is a neuroscientific model that hovers at the horizon between conscious and unconscious processes and moves back and forth across it. And it's supposed to say them, I think, but that's what she said in the book. Um, do you see the parallel here to what's happening with our poetry, our leaping poetry into the subconscious mind and back to the conscious mind, our aboriginal cultural knowledge where we're talking about the points in between, right? The ancient Chinese cultural knowledge of dragon smoke and it's, it's leading you to somewhere mythical, all right? This is neuroscience finally coming to that same conclusion. It's really incredible. And so that, this, this is the kind of stuff that has lived with me my whole life and I couldn't understand it. Like I said, I've always been fascinated with why. Why music? Why, why does this kid from St. Paul, Minnesota, um, who, who had piano lessons when he was a kid, how did I get so absolutely enamored with music, knowing that you know, I was unlikely to be as rich as Bill Gates or whatever, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not Taylor Swift. Um, but, but you know, it's, it's, it's like I can't, you talk to a lot of artists and they'll say, I can't help but do this. You talk to educators are the same way. I can't help but do this, right? And I think this is why. These things are why. It is so important for us as a human culture, as humanity, to be able to consider what it means to be human, right? And to think about the ways that we're different than all the things we create and all of the other things on this planet and in this universe. There is something special about humanity. It's really unique. It's really fascinating. And this has driven writing and thought and study and, and, and religions and spirituality for millennia, right? But I think as we're starting to learn more from the science side of thing and we're combining it with this humanistic way of approaching how we think about the important things in life, right? That's what I think we're gonna take with us into the next 150 years when we have, we have computers to do our jobs for us, right? There's this really funny quote going around Twitter and uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna give credit to the right person because I can't remember her name, but it was just all over the place. And she said something like, you know, for God's sakes, we want, AI to do our laundry and the dishes so I can go make art, not the other way around, <laughs> right? And it's so true, right? Um, and so all of these things combined, I know that there's a lot of disparate information in here, um, but it all pulls together 
um, I think, into this one thing that's like, what does it mean to be a human? What does it mean for us to be in this room together, talking to each other? Well, I'm talking at you, um, but hopefully we'll talk a little bit afterwards and talk to each other, with each other. What does that mean? How is that different than every other physical process that happens in this universe, right? I'm also fascinated with astrophysics of all things. Um, just because I think it's just fascinating how we, you know, consciousness and this idea of emergence and all of these things. Um, how do those things play into just this moment right now and who we are as humans, right? What is that magical piece? It really is a magical piece. We're understanding now how our bodies are starting to be able to make sense of the magical piece, but we don't understand the magical piece yet, right? And so to me, being a musician and performing and sharing music with others is my way to make sure that we remain human beings, right? And you know, I'm a jazz musician. Jazz is something like 1.02% of the worldwide music population. Classical music is even less, and I'm also a classical musician, right? Um, so it's not like I'm in this for the money, right? I'm not in this to be famous, um, but I am in this because it means something to be a human being. Right? And as we go into this crazy future, um, uh, you know, and who knows what's going to happen, and the world is a mess, and, you know, we, we can't get along, and, and there's wars, um, and we're running out of resources, and all the things, or all the things, right? There is something about being human that we need to take with us that's going to help us navigate all of that, right? And so music is one way to do that, and I think it's a really important way. So, um, with that being said, uh, I, I already kind of talked about this, um, but I'll just make the point that don't feel bad if you don't make music because you need people to listen to, right? Um, but this is a really cool quote from um, G. Gabrielle Starr as well. She says, music by prodding listeners to move with the rhythm and by influencing their breath and heartbeat may strike closer to the core of one's interoceptive sense of self. Does anyone know what interoceptive is? I wanted to use a different word, but she used a very scholarly word. It's like, it's like the sense of yourself, like in your organs, like how your body operates, right? That's essentially what an interoceptive look at your body means. Does that make sense? But anyway, her point is that music is one of those, because of its attachment to rhythm and attachment to breath, um, it, it gets, you know, it's kind of like Huxley's quote about music is, you know, besides silence, which is a brilliant observation, um, music is the one thing that gets closest to expressing the inexpressible. This is the same sentiment here, right? So um, this is a slide that I had in here and I've already talked about 500 times, um, so I'm not gonna say it again. I'm gonna play one quick thing for you. Um, that, and I just want to check my time here. Um, oh, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to play one quick um, uh, thing for you, and then we'll have some time for questions. And so, thank you very much. This is, a, this is another piece um, that, that is a recent piece of mine. This is called Borderlands, and it's about, um, you know, living in Texas for a long time, about, you know, imagine if you grew up in a family that just happened to live by the Rio Grande River, and then these governments came and established an artificial border for you. I mean, I had a, a really close friend um, who was from El Paso, and his family was from, most of them lived in Mexico. His parents had moved to El Paso, and essentially he hadn't seen his aunts and uncles for 20 years, right? That kind of thing. And so this piece was inspired by that. A little, little bit of a piece here, and then we'll certainly open it up for questions.
So, thank you.